allowed them to finally make the conclusion that they dreaded, which was this was in fact a vascular occlusion with a non-reversible product. Welcome to the Aesthetics Mastery Show. I'm Dr. Tim Pierce. Hi, I'm Miranda Pierce. And today we've got an extra special episode for you. It's unfortunately started with a very sad injury that happened to one of our colleagues in the US. So Julie Kaplan is an experienced aesthetic nurse who suffered her own vascular occlusion 10 years ago. But there's so much value in this case that I thought we should unravel it all and think about all we can learn from this injury so that it doesn't happen to anyone else. But before we dive in, give this episode a like and I will do my absolute best to live up to your expectations and teach you something very useful. This is going to be a great episode. So give us that like and let's dive in. So what was so special about this case? So there's something really special and precious about complications that happen to clinicians. And I've realized this through a couple of patient interviews that I've done over the years. When that patient is also a clinician, you get a different level of detail because they document things better, they reflect on things better, they understand all the stages and, and very little of the information is lost. Uh, usually when you talk to a patient about a complication, uh, unfortunately a lot of the clinical stuff they don't understand and they remember more of the experience. What you get with a clinician is both the human side and the clinical factual side and you can put them together for a much clearer picture of what actually happened. So. There's so much great information in this, and that's why I thought it was worth doing a, a YouTube show on it, uh, not just the interview, which you can check out on Instagram. So give us a brief recap of what happened. So the procedure itself, relatively simple when I explain it, not the way we would inject these days, but Julie was injected with a 0.75 mil bolus of radius mixed with lidocaine and adrenaline, and that was placed in her mid-cheek. So... If I look at the injection point, which you can still see in one of the photographs that we were taken, you can see that an entry point is just inferior to the angle of the zygoma, a little bit medial to that angle as well, but a little lateral to the mid pupillary line. So this is very important when you come to understand the anatomy later. It was a 25 gauge needle, three quarter inch, and placed onto the periosteum with 0.75 mils of product added, as we said, in one bolus. So that's much more than most of us would inject in one bolus these days, um, but that was the style in those uh, 10 years ago. The procedure seemingly was completed uneventfully and neither one of them were concerned until Julie looked in the mirror where she noticed some blanching. And that was the first signal that things hadn't gone according to plan. But uh, we'll dive into this in more detail, but the lidocaine and adrenaline mixture threw both of the clinicians into believing that it was a side effect of adrenaline rather than an occlusion that was causing the blanching. So when did they actually realise it was a VO? So Julie had her suspicions straight away, but she reflectively said that she allowed herself to be fooled into thinking what was more comfortable to believe, which was that it was simply a side effect of the adrenaline. It was really later on that night, uh, Julie's husband is a surgeon, and the combination of pain that she started to develop six hours later, plus the signs that she could see, allowed them to finally make the conclusion that they dreaded, which was this was in fact a vascular occlusion with a non-reversible product. So what happened next? So after the initial concern about the pala, which then uh, Julie and her clinician thought wasn't to worry about, it was the pain and the discoloration that happened later that really led them to believe that this was a vascular occlusion. So this is the levido reticularis pattern, which you sometimes see, but not always. And you can see in the pictures it's not the most convincing version of this rash. Um, I think it might have been a fleeting example, but certainly the discoloration, the levido element, rather than the reticular element, is very clear to see. Uh, and this is what led them to believe that it was an occlusion. Now, unfortunately, with a non-reversible product, we have this issue, which is there, there wasn't an enormous amount that they could do. So the rescue plan in those days was simply to massage the area, to use a warm compress, and then await for requiring wound ma management. There was no access to a hyperbaric oxygen chamber. So instead, we just progress with tissue breakdown. Tell us about this levido reticularis. So le levido reticularis is a rash that you get when the blood supply is disrupted. And it comes from understanding that there is a, there's an anatomical subunit of vascular supply to the skin. You can think of them as little cones. So you have a little capillary that runs up the middle 
or a branch of capillaries like a tree and that, that's where the fresh blood enters the skin and then the veins drain around the perimeter. So the levido element is where the, the deoxygenated blood is building up and you get a dark pattern usually in a ring shape and the uh, it's the dark pattern that is the that, that's deoxygenated that looks like liver. So levido means looks like liver. So the levido pattern and then the reticular pattern is because there are patches of white mixed in with patches of the purple or the, the liver the liver color. Uh, and that's what you get this, this uh, rash that's more often called a mottled rash. And when does that come? So it can happen within the first half an hour. And sometimes it's there for a fairly long time but it can it can happen later on a couple of hours later but it can be quite fleeting so the, the ones I've seen it's not always that clear um in the middle of it and sometimes around the outside you can get a hint that this is this is part of that pattern um it's definitely something that's that's great to know about but I wouldn't rate it as the number one um diagnostic criteria for a vascular occlusion it's just one of the stages that you sometimes see but sometimes you miss it so what do you think had happened anatomically so I'm trying to imagine in my head with this entry point and the volume of filler injected and knowing the anatomy, how we could have occluded a vessel. Now, it looks to me that if you were standing on that side of the face, on that side of the bed, there may be a slight angle more medially. And this is something worth thinking about. Whenever you're injecting a fleshy area, your inaccuracies are multiplied. So if you're at a slight angle when you enter, that the position, the final resting point of that needle might be in a place that you're just not that clear on um, because there's most of the needle you can't see. So um, we're always projecting in our mind's eye where we think the needle is landing. And uh, in this case, I could just, I just thought potentially it might be more medial than the injector realized because of a slight angle. So it's, it's one of these cases that really make you think very carefully about how your angle of entry changes the relative risk of getting into a place you wouldn't want to be. And um, this is just one way of thinking about reducing risk, is that if you think, if I go in this direction, I'm closer to one of the major vessels, what can I do to reduce the risk of that? You might change your angle slightly. Not that I think many inject in this exact place anymore, but um, I hope not. Um, but think, think about the relative risk. So it looks to me like maybe a slight angle um, if you were on the periosteum, you'd be quite medial. You'd be right in that near that infraorbital orbital artery. So if you if you take a look at the shape of the skin discoloration, you can see this very clearly fits with the path that you'd expect the infraorbital artery blood supply to flow. So the infraorbital artery supplies the anterior cheek um, as well as the lower eyelid, and it depends how deep you go in in terms of what other structures it applies. We're going to cover that in some detail. Um, but it's it, it very clear to me that that's the most likely vessel that was occluded. But there are also little anastomoses, so it also seemed to affect the lateral part of the nose, so the ala is, it was affected. That you'd normally, the textbook would suggest would be the lateral nasal artery or the ala, infra-ala artery that were affected. But I imagine in reality many of these vessels are connected um, or, or at least supported by each other sufficiently that, um, that it affected that area in terms of necrosis as well. Oh, so scary. There's nothing you could do. Awful. Well, not with a non-reversible product, yeah. Because normally at this point, we're talking, uh, when people put uh, vascular occlusions onto the WhatsApp group and all of that, we're talking about, you know, okay, you know, reverse and here's what to do. But you just got to wait. Julie just had to wait. It's awful. Yeah, it's fairly fairly terrifying process to go through. Are there any other areas that would be affected if we block this artery? So I think it's really important to use this case to teach how the arteries are connected up together and so that you can start to anticipate potential injuries from blocking a certain artery. So if you start with the local injection, obviously it supplies the area where you've just injected, but we also need to work back and see what else could be affected and try and explain what Julie's symptoms were that she experienced as well. So the, the infraorbital artery supplies the anterior cheek, as you can see, that's the bit that's most obvious in this case. Um, there's also the lateral part of the nose and the gums, which you can also see. She also took a photograph of the gingiva of her gums showing a little bit of stress, but they weren't too badly injured. Um, and then as you go more superiorly, there are more important structures that could be potentially affected. So superiorly, the infraorbital artery supplies the lower eyelid and the lacrimal sac, and it anastomoses with the angular artery as well and the dorsal artery. So you're connecting with that whole important blood supply. Potentially, there's a risk for blindness if you were to get enough product into that area as well. And then while in the infraorbital canal on the floor of the orbit, 
It also supplies some of the muscles which move the eye. So the inferior rectus and the inferior oblique muscles is, is supplied by the same blood, blood vessel. And some of those vessels also go into the maxillary sinus and then the teeth of the upper jaw. Further in, it becomes the maxillary artery. So if you have a look at the anatomy of the maxillary artery, you'll see that it terminates in the infraorbital artery. And the maxillary artery supplies all sorts of important structures in the mid-phase. So we have a portion that supplies the nasopharynx, the upper teeth, the deep temple arteries, which supply the muscles of mastication, um, jaw movement, and even the eardrum is supplied by this artery. So you can just imagine how bad an injury could be if enough product flowed into that system. And I and Julie also feel incredibly lucky when you think about how much was injected, 0.75, nearly a full mil, and she thankfully only had the more superficial part of the injury. And, and I don't think all of it went in. I think most of it would have gone into her cheek and some of it blocked the vessel. So it could have been a whole lot worse and we can all just be very thankful that it wasn't. Okay, so some of this radius has gone into the, the vessel. We can't reverse it. What happened next? Well, one thing we can at least get from this is learn from the stages of necrosis. So you can actually see how this case evolved, um, which will help you better improve your diagnostic skills if anyone ever does present to your clinic with one of these um, types of injuries. So the first thing you'll see after the initial occlusion is, is simply the pallor. So the paleness that Julie spotted in the mirror but wasn't sure what it was yet. Uh, and then we go into this gray gray blue color with the sur surrounding levator reticularis that we talked about. Um, there is some hint of the reticular pattern within the first 24 to 36 hours in Julie's case. And you can see this in the pictures. And then the earliest sign of pustule formation actually happens around 24 hours because we've got all the dates and the photographs uh, which you can see up on the screen. And that's earlier than many textbooks would say. We often say 36 hours for the first pustules, but you can definitely see that on the ailer of her nose starting a bit sooner. Pustule formation is then really underway by 48 hours and there's the first area of coagulation which is part of the process of necrosis where the tissue starts to blacken and there's some bleeding underneath the skin as the vessels lose integrity. So coagulation is simply when the proteins start to break down. It's just like if you cook an egg, the protein coagulates and changes and becomes firmer. That's one of the first stages of necrosis as proteins no longer function in their normal way. Um, by 72 hours, the pustules are much worse and there's also surrounding inflammation. And then by day four, it looks like more of the coagulation stage of, the cro of necrosis, where it's deteriorating, but still has some tissue integrity with small areas of bleeding underneath and dark areas starting to become visible. And then day, by day five, the tissue is breaking down and sloughing off. This stage of necrosis is when the enzymes are releasing, um, dying, they're basically being released by the dying cells and are actually digesting the connective tissue. So your, your big macromolecules, your protein, elastin, collagen, all being digested and it actually starts to slough off. And you can see that very clearly. There's this, this movement into a more liquid phase as that dead tissue moves away from the living tissue. And if there's any good news, then it's, it's over now. Like that's the worst of the tissue death. And we can now get on to the healing phase, which is also beautifully documented by Julie. So tell us about it. How did the healing break down? So if you have a look at the pictures, you'll see that the inflammation phase starts to pick up around day seven. And then there's proliferation of new skin cells. You can see this with the changing texture on the surface of the skin and the color of that tissue, which is clearly living tissue. And um, this is really underway by the end of the second week. The area also looks a bit lumpy and irregular. And um, most of the healing, though, even though it's lumpy and irregular, will is completing by the end of the second and the third week. And then by three weeks, the wound is effectively healed, but it's not in its final stage of completion. So there's no, no more surface of living, you know, blood supply supplied to the open air. It's now healed up, um, but it's not neat yet. And there's a remodeling phase, which you can see takes a long time. So it, it's the, the bulk of it's probably in the first six weeks where the redness dies down. Um, but then there are actually up to two years where the, the, the scar can continuously uh, improve itself and become more and more... Um, organized. Okay, so that is the documented version of events um, that we've got. There's tons of real life experience in there, which I hope you appreciate. The next episode we're going to cover is to really analyze how we, what we can actually take from this case to make sure that we all get safer. So when you reflect on a case like this, there's often multiple small events that you can learn from. So how would you decrease the risk of the same thing happening again, 
or decrease the severity of the event or respond better to the complication once it's arisen. And it's a really good process to go through with any time you have an event like this. And we're going to do it all in completion as best as I can uh, in the next episode of the series of two videos on this topic. So we'll see you next week for that. And in the meantime, if you would like to hear Julie's experience firsthand, then we'll link in the description below to the Instagram live that she and Tim did recently. And if you're keen to see Tim's lessons next week, then definitely subscribe and hit the bell to be notified when we upload that video. Thanks for watching. Take care.